take the honor of beginning my humble comments with the eight verses of the Holy Quran and the beauty and the significance of these eight verses is that according to the tradition of the spiritual masters and according to the tradition of the highest of the religious scholars, these were the eight verses that were on the lips of Imam Hussain after his shahadat when he was put on the lands. The eight verses, and this was no small claim, this was no ordinary claim that people make that these were the verses that Imam Hussain was reciting, his head was reciting when he was on top of the lands. Those verses are Taha. Allah <laughs> Allah la ilaha illa huwa lahu al-asma'u al-husana The translation Taha We have not sent down to you the Quran that you so that you are distressed We have not sent down the Quran to you so that you are distressed but only as a reminder for those who fear Allah A revelation from he who has created the earth and the highest heavens the most merciful who is above the throne established. To him belongs what is in the heavens and what is on the earth and what is between them and what is under the soil. And if you speak aloud, then indeed, but even otherwise, he knows the secret and what is even hidden in your hearts. Allah, there is no deity except him. To him belong the best of names. And I ask the Mumineen sitting here to please come forward so that if there are some women who come in later, they can they can be placed there. Say another salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. My task has been made much easier uh, with some excellent presentations, and my task today will be my task has been made easier because of the excellent presentations which explain both from the youngsters and from the elders which provide a very important context what I plan to do is as an academic it's the greatest of honors for me to sit on this chair but in my role as an academic I will first explain the thesis of what I want to explain, then I'll raise some questions, and then in my discussion in about 50 minutes or so or less, I will try to answer those questions. The general theme that was provided to me, and now I understand more why so very appropriately, is to talk about Islam and scholarship. So I begin with the basic contention that Islam in its very essence, in its very basic nature, is an invitation to seek knowledge and pursue scholarship. Wow. We often understand Islam as a religion, as a set of beliefs. But my contention today is that the maturity of your belief, the strength of your belief, the understanding of your belief mm. is in direct proportion to your level of knowledge. Wallah. Hence, knowledge and Islam are not only inseparable, they are inextricable. Wallah. They are dependent on each other. The basic point I would explain to support my viewpoint is the very first word, the very first verse that came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Read. In the name of God who has created you. 
creation is a physical phenomenon. The very fact to the very words with which God is introducing himself are all in reference to the knowledge which is the physical knowledge of the world. It could have been said it is about a spiritual message. It is about your spiritual significance of the, or the understanding of the creation. No, it was said, speak in the name of God who is your creator. Well, and those of you who know these verses well, in the very next two verses, there is a reference to Kalam. Read, think about your creation, and think about what is written. That's my basic claim. How I am going to go about it is that I have divided my presentation into about five parts. And within each five points, I have about five sub-points. Um, and it is no coincidence, as you will know, why I am referring to each thing with the word five. The most recent of the experience that I had with this idea of five was about three or four weeks ago. I had the greatest of honor to go to Baghdad, Karbala and Najaf. And from there, I flew to, to Brisbane, Australia, where there's a conference called Club de Madrid. This is a group of about 40 head of the states, former head of the states, who get together every year to think about global issues. <coughs> I was honored to speak to the group in a, in a small audience. So when I went, this was my first visit to Australia. And um, I wanted to go to some old historic place. So they, they took me to a place which is associated with a tribal group, which is based in, in Australia. And I went to, in routine, I saw a couple of things, went to one of their shops, and in their shop, um, I wanted to buy, I'm a mug collector, so I was looking for a mug. I saw some ties, and this was this one tie, of course, which immediately uh, attracted my attention, uh, because it had a, what we call a puncha on it. So all the hands on that tie, and I asked them, what is the significance? They said, because this is one of the oldest of the tribes in Australia. And they believed that there is some spiritual blessing associated with this hand. And with the whole idea of five. And that's why we assume it. So in any case, this was just a point that came to my mind. So what I'll do is, in five parts that my presentation um, is divided into, the very first point will be trying to give you some more references from, from the Quranic tradition uh, of what actually is the linkage between Islam and scholarship. Then, in a natural way, I will move to what the Prophet of Islam says about it. And I have picked some very unique ahadith, not selectively to actually only those which substantiate or support my <coughs> point, but these are ones which are not often repeated or quoted. But these today, of course, are in reference to the emphasis I want to put on the linkage between Islam and scholarship. The third point, if I'm able to explain and substantiate that, will be to talk about if God and his, the greatest of his prophet were so interested in creating this, creating this linkage between knowledge and religion, there must have been some institutional arrangement which was put in place so that the ordinary believers actually follow learning and scholarship. So what are the five pillars of that knowledge-based system? Or what are the five foundations of that institutional arrangement that I'll talk about? Then in the fourth phase, I'll talk about five major challenges and the obstacles. Because if everything was well defined, well explained, there is an institutional basis also. Why is it that today we see anything but a strong linkage and association between scholarship and Islam? Whether in the modern day world, the new initiatives, the new explanations, the new advancements in all kinds of sciences, are these being done by the hands of the Muslims or not? If not, it was something must have gone wrong mm. in terms of that tradition. What are those five obstacles? And in the end, I'll explain whether is this a civilization debate? Is, this, is it too broad? Is it too big? Or maybe is it that people like you and me as individuals 
as part of this tradition can also make this humble contribution towards understanding and in whatever humble way we can in strengthening and supporting the linkage between Islam and scholarship. So what will be the five major things you and I need to do? Mm -hmm. So that's the, the outline. Um, yeah, yeah. Of course, with, for 25 points in 50 minutes means, means hardly a couple of minutes for each. So I need your um, a focus and patience um, uh, to, to hear to my this um, discourse, yeah. which may not be very articulate, but, but I need your, um, your good vibes um, to come to me to make, to make this happen. So I explain and I'll begin with the first three questions which are already embedded. Is Islam actually only talking about religious knowledge, all the great names that we read? Or is it about broader sense of knowledge? Is it, are the sciences included or not? The second question, who opposed, in essence, this tradition of learning and scholarship and why? Why is also very important. Mm. Because if you are a believer and you genuinely believe in God in whatever form or shape um, and you understand this linkage, why will you really oppose it? Um, there might be some reason and what that can be. So these are the two questions I want you to keep in mind. But let me jump just straight into my first argument. The five principles from where the God and you are, I'm sure the adults here are very familiar with all these ideas. Um, it is uh, the younger generation here, which is more of my audience, uh, or more, uh, my, my discussion or discourse will be more geared towards them. Uh, um, and the adults, I'm sure, and the elders uh, know about it better than me. So the five principles. First and foremost, we often hear, and I, I'm partly influenced by some of the great presentations and the ideas which were discussed here earlier today, this evening. For instance, the whole idea of, of Fakir, and the whole idea of this linkage between Fakiri and Shabiri. Mm. Wow. We are often told that Quran actually has seven different layers of explanation. Wow. Seven different layers of explanation. Now I'm not very qualified to explain to you or give to an example because that will be the, the responsibility or, or the domain uh, of a religious scholar. Mm -hmm. But this much we know for sure that we were told from day one that because this is a book which is going to sustain itself as a source of guidance and the whole idea of understanding and explanation and comprehension has to go till the end of the world so there are seven meanings hidden in this and every person depending on your qualification your knowledge your interest uh, your depth of knowledge and the guidance you may seek there are seven layers so God is not sending you a set of principles saying, this is it. It is a dynamic situation. So the verses of Quran have seven meanings. And what I am inferring is, that if there are seven meanings embedded, there is an invitation from God from day one. Try to search and seek those layers. The second point is about Haruf Mukatya. Has anyone given us? a very good understanding and definition of that. Human beings could have said, the very first uh, verses of the Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah say, this is a guidance but for the Parhezga, but, but for those who are pious. Nowhere it is mentioned that it has certain secret codes, but there are certain secret codes with Haruf al Some people may know about it, some at times, some uh, ulema and fuqaha have said even don't make an attempt to go and pursue these. But nonetheless, there must be a cause. So that is also a dynamic situation. That also means um, you are continuously trying to understand and continu continuously trying to go deeper into that knowledge. The third point, the number of verses in Quran which continuously invite you to think mm. are in dozens. Surah Ali Imran, just as an example, verse 190. Can't you see the coming and going of the day and night? And these are the signs for those who are endowed with insight. It is so very interesting that the eight verses that Imam Hussain picked, and there must be a reason and a big mystery and a big secret. Why were those eight verses recited from Imam Hussain after his shahadat that I had mentioned, that I had started off? Those also refer continuously to, to the creation of the earth and the heavens. 
Uh -huh. That again I am saying, there is this constant, not only invitation now, it is encouragement. It is constantly, God is seeking you as well. Well, if you want to enter this domain, please come and try to explore what is hidden in Islam. The fourth <coughs> point with this con first, my very first point of introduction from Quran is the prayers. When there was this dialogue taking place between Iblis or Shaitan and Adam. And Iblis is making an argument that no, I am superior because I am fire. And Adam is making an argument different than that. Iblis is continuously saying, I am Afzal, I am superior because I am fire and the other side, Adam is made of clay. What is the argument that was given from God to defeat this argument? The argument was, I have given some knowledge to Adam which makes him superior. And if you argue, you see, I mean, the argument of Iblis was in a different context. But the God is emphasizing, no, I have given him some knowledge that makes him superior. Same is the case with Hazrat Suleiman. I'm sure all of you, the elders, know very well the story of the, this Takhte Yahya bin Barkhiya, Takhte Sabah, Asif bin Barkhiya, that he could bring in that Takht of Bilkis in what they call Chashme Zadan. And it is clearly mentioned from the God that we have given him some little knowledge of a book. Again, the criterion being established here is of your knowledge, of your understanding. It's all about your level of knowledge and your wisdom. Even in the invitation and the encouragement and the seeking from the God side, all the principles that are being set are about your knowledge and level of wisdom and understanding. And last but not the least, very simple prayer. Most of us, all of us I hope, recite often, Rabbe Zidni Ilma, which was emphasized by all the Imams and the great jurists also. That you are continuously demanding this, Rabbe Zidni Ilma. So these were only the five points I wanted to just touch upon as an introduction. That Rabbe Zidni Ilma is please God, give me knowledge. Increase my knowledge. Add to my information or knowledge or wisdom. So the, this was my first introductory point. These are the five pillars on which I think in my humble way, this is how Quran or this is how God invites you towards knowledge and information. Wow. Now the next stage, leaving aside all the prophets who had come before, the next stage of course, immediate reference is to the Prophet of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The five ahadiths which I'll just quickly go through because I have to go very far. The five ahadiths I just want to mention and I'll pass by, but each of these have a principle. Like the very first things which I had mentioned from the Quran were clearly making a reference to effort and superior guidance. So the five principles from Ahadith, the very first one, which some people have tried, are nowadays trying to say that this is controversial and you will just come to know why uh, those are saying that it is controversial, was the ink of a scholar's pen the ink of a scholar's pen is more sacred than the blood of a martyr. No. No. So the hadith, which is there is a debate, of course, from some of the militant organizations today who argue that because they are continuously trying to recruit people by saying that everything else is different, different, but going to the battlefield, which they explain as jihad. So for them, this was a big threat. For them, them this was a big shock. But I have seen in this, this you are welcome to go on internet and you will find and we can help also help you. There is a lot of support uh, for this uh, hadith that the ink of a scholar's pen is mightier or more sacred than the blood of a martyr, martyr is very strong and valid. The second one, second hadith. The second hadith which I want to reference as the second pillar of what the Prophet is making an argument about is that excessive knowledge and as you know in everything Islam says come towards the middle be balanced in one case it is arguing excessive knowledge 
is better than excessive praying. Excessive knowledge is better than excessive praying. And that is also very insightful because continuously we hear from various different narrations uh, that we are asked that the whole purpose of your creation is ibadat or praying. But if it has to be compared with something, the Prophet is very clearly arguing excessive knowledge is better than excessive praying. So if there is an excess of anything that is permissible, that is knowledge. The third pillar of this prophetic tradition that I want to talk about is a very basic principle that all of the kids know. The Prophet of Islam was continuously introducing himself as a Muallim. That was the prime profession or the identity that Prophet talked about and I link this with this my third point which is that his, his, his quotation is Hadadis whosoever honors the learned honors me whosoever honors the learned honors me and this helps me to come to my fourth point if he was emphasizing knowledge and seeking of knowledge so much there must have been some way that he will mention how to really actually go about it and that is explained in this fourth hadith that I have picked up for, for you where he says knowledge is maintained only through teaching and I looked at the translations because when you are quoting Quran or hadith and you are using the word only it has a lot of significance because you are making it directly dependent on each other those of you from academia and there are many uh, scholars sitting here uh, this whole idea of variable a dependent variable He's saying the only way to maintain your knowledge is by teaching. The fifth point, the last pillar of my argument is about another verse which every kid here knows. Which is about the Prophet of Islam had said, seek knowledge even if you have to go to China for that. Now very basic question. Was China ever known as a center of religious learning? Was at that time China known for any kind of major um, learning institution? No. Or even later on? No. This was just at that time. The main reason for mentioning this was the issue of distance. Nowadays you take a flight and you, you are anywhere you want to go. In the, other, the longest flight I have ever taken was to Australia which was 18 hours. But 18 hours in those days means actually maybe 18 months. So the, F, the reference was that in this pursuance of knowledge, you actually have to even sacrifice a lot. So now I just want to go to my third phrase, but just by repeating what we have learned so far from the main principles from Quran and from the main principles of Hadith. From Quran, what I emphasized was there is an, is an emphasis on effort, on guidance, and on thinking. Continuously, God is arguing, arguing with you, almost arguing. Why don't you think? Why don't you spend some time to go deeper into it and think? Anyone who is looking at Quran to, to find out some written down principles will be disappointed because God is just giving some of the principles but then asking you to continuously think. From the ahadith we came to know that going through this process <coughs> of effort and seeking guidance and thinking, this process is actually binding on you. That's what the Prophet had said. Quran explains the process of effort, guidance or seeking guidance and thinking and the Prophet had said it is binding on every man and woman to try to get education. And from the Prophet's teaching, we also came to know that this is not only binding, it is a sacred responsibility. I'm just reminding you of the hadith. When the Prophet says, if you want to honor me, honor the learned. Or honoring the learned means you're honoring me. So not only that this is a binding responsibility, this is a sacred responsibility. And last but not the least, this was mentioned through a hadith as a criterion to judge. So your level of knowledge and education is not only playing a critical role for you to comprehend religion. It is also a criterion through which your status is judged. 
So this is very different from just being mentioning get educated. Oh, why don't you think? They're saying no, get educated. This is binding. You have to go through this. You have to even sacrifice and we will judge you by virtue of your status of knowledge and ill. Now, having in my humble way established these principles, which I'm sure were already established in your minds, I want to go to the next stage and explain if this was so central as I'm claiming, there must have been a strong institutional arrangement, a divine arrangement for us to continue to pursue this path. Voila. What is that institutional arrangement? And I think there are five principles again. Salu Allah Muhammad. Now I am entering a little complex situation. It is not complicated by the way. The difference between the word complex as you would know um, <laughs> means that there are various factors now which are at play. And complexity is which means which is more troublesome combination or the formula. Now we are told the first institutional arrangement of course is again very basic. I want to remain, make this, uh, not that I am claiming that I have a higher level of understanding, but I am trying to make it easy for the kids. The very first source of institutional arrangement of course was the very presence of Quran, which was so very different from Torah and from Injil. As you would know, we often say there are five uh, books, the divine books, but the actual number of books, some of which came through pamphlets. Uh, some of which came through small actual lectures which were from prophets. After all, there were 124,000 prophets. It can't be that only five of them came with some message which was in written form. There were 313 and all what I'm saying, um, I can give you later on references if you want. There was a total of 313 small books or booklets. The, the five we often refer to, of course, are the most supreme, are coming from the Ulil Azm uh, prophets or, or coming from the most uh, important foundations which, which were created. But the total number was 313. So in this case, when we are told that this is different, all those 313 probably you cannot get your hands on those. And you know that the very reason why the religion of Islam had to come was, and this was the religion given to Christians and Jews, that your books, not that there was something defective in those books, it was that you have distorted those, you have changed those books. Mm -hmm. So there's a need for a new book. So the sanctity now and the sacredness mm -hmm. and the credibility of every word of this Quran becomes extremely important. Zalala. But every major historian and writer tells us, that the book was not in the written form when the prophet passed away. It was not available in the book in form. The credibility of Quran, of course, is the credibility of the prophet. I'm sure you, many of you have heard that famous uh, speech from uh, Mr. Talib Jori. He often says it in, in a beautiful fashion that in fact the, the trust in God is exposed through your trust in prophet because you are trusting his word it is your trust in the word of prophet that is in fact reflects your trust in God mm. because God has not talked to you it is the prophet who's saying this book is from God mm. but when the prophet has gone away he's passed into a different world and the book is still not there then the credibility of whosoever collected the book up, book becomes significant as well mm. it becomes hugely important and that we know two different narrations. One is that Hazrat Ali alayhi salam actually vanished from the public scene. Some say 40 days, some say 2 years. Because he had made a commitment or he was given this task. I should put it like that. May God forgive me if I frame anything in a wrong fashion. And may guide me widely when I am talking to say it in the right fashion. The responsibility that Hazrat Ali was given was that he will actually collect those and he had taken it upon himself. So his role also becomes central in all of this that he will collect. The, there's other narration as well. The, the mainstream history, and I would not 
there are other ways to frame it as well. The other narration, I should say, is also that this was collected at the time of the third caliph of Islam. And that it was Hazrat Usman who collected. Maybe many people made some contribution. But Hazrat Ali's contribution to it was the most significant. This was the only, the major central point that I wanted to make at this time, at this point, that Quran's essence and significance was so central that whosoever made the arrangement, because this was the institutional arrangement for the phase of knowledge and the guidance to continue to come to you, because everything after the Prophet was now revolving around the Quran. I link this now with my second point. There is some difference of opinion as to who collected it and when, but there is no difference of opinion at all in the famous hadith that Anna Madina Tul Elme wa Aliun Babuha. There was no one else also who ever claimed that asked me till I am among you. The status of Hazrat Ali alayhi salam as a source of knowledge or his superiority mm -hmm. in comparison to anyone else was solely, if I may say, or primarily based on his level and status of his knowledge and education. So, so this is the second institutional arrangement that was done. First was <laughs> ensuring that Quran and his its sanctity remains the second institutional arrangement was through the personality of Hazrat Ali who from the day, who from the beginning was groomed. There was a reason that he was among those who were with the Prophet from day one. Throughout the ups and downs in the battlefield or in the mosque that Hazrat Ali was close to the Prophet always because he was constantly receiving this knowledge and wisdom as well. Mm -hmm. So the very fact that Hazrat Ali was called that he is the door through which you will acquire knowledge the very fact of his caliber his status his knowledge i would argue was the institutional arrangement made from god so that this religion and the significance of knowledge in this religion remains intact the third point from this that i come to is now coming to more if i may call that mundane and that is two personalities, which I'll quickly go through their names and their contributions. But I highly encourage you to look at these names. And of course, many of you know, and we often recite their names and we often uh, recite prayers in their names of Hazrat Imam Baqir and Hazrat Imam Chafar Sadiq. These are the two Imams who created the foundation of what you and we call as the modern institutions of learning. Sure. And for this, I am not making this argument from actually any of the major Shia traditions. I am making these traditions, making a reference to these from three or four major books. One is a major work by a, French, a group of French scholars who looked at the work of Imam Jafar Sadiq and explained that Baitul Hikmah, which was established in Baghdad, where some of the most historic of personalities in the field of sciences were groomed, that those institutions were nurtured by the Imam. Mm. And there are four names. Please go and I'm now addressing more the youngsters and Google these names. Jabir ibn Hayyan, Ibn Sina, Nasir al-Din Tusi, Al-Khwarzami, the book by Ibn Sina, the most well-known book, Kitab al-Shifa, was translated in 30, not only 30 languages, that was taught as a textbook in Western institutions for a long time. Ibn Hatim's book, Kitab al-Manazir, which means optics, was taught in the West. You pick any major discourse on who were the major initiators or those who played the most central role in the science of chemistry, <coughs> physics and mathematics, you will come across there is almost a consensus mm -hmm. within the western world about the names of Ibn Sina, Ibn Hatim, Al-Khwarzami and Jabir, the father of chemistry, Jabir Ibn Hayyan. The, out of these five, 
four of them were direct students of Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam. This is also established as a, there is a consensus on these names and their traditions. Pick please any major book written by a political scientist or an historian about the role of Muslim Muslims in the propagation of or the earlier work or in terms of the establishment and foundations of physics, science and mathematics and you'll come across these names. And check any major source about Jabir Mehayan and you'll immediately find out within the first two paragraphs. And I say this with a lot of confidence having tried this uh, uh, search many a times. You'll always within the first two, three paragraphs you'll find whose student it was. Even those who had any kind of bias couldn't help but mention this, that these four or five major luminaries in the field of science had their association with the Imams. What I'm referring here is my third, I'm still at the third point of the institutional arrangement, that this institutional arrangement, it was not by coincidence or not by default. It was very well planned. There's a reason this whole concept of Imamat was in place. And the placement of this concept was directly linked to knowledge and scholarship. This brings me to my fourth point. It is often mentioned, and now this is a very sensitive and a difficult point to make. So I, I need your patience and support. It is often argued that if there was a large chunk of knowledge which had, only, which had already come from, from the heavens to the earth, and it was just the sharing of this knowledge, that was the prophetic tradition, that was the role of the prophets. But if Islam was claiming itself that no, this knowledge is being constantly created, and I'll refer you immediately to this new discovery in the last few years or decades, that when they found in the field of astronomy, they realized when they were in the business of counting how many solar systems are there, uh, what is the nature of this cosmos, they finally argued no. It is actually still being created. The more and more that we know of this large, broader universe, it is still in the phase of formation. So knowledge from the Almighty is also being constantly produced. The very fact that knowledge is constantly being produced, God has taken upon himself the responsibility that so long as knowledge is coming, he will provide some level of guidance continuously who will be able to interpret and understand that knowledge. Now we know that the divine books have come, the prophets have come and this I am linking with the, with the idea of a verse which I will narrate which is the verse 12 of Surah Yasin which all of us recite quite often which is called the heart of Quran as well. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim there is a whole corpus of scholarship around this point of what is this meant. People argue, I just first actually translate it so that I explain the context and why I am mentioning this in those five foundations of the institutional arrangement for from God to ensure that this seeking of knowledge, search of knowledge, dissemination of knowledge, comprehension of knowledge is central, inseparable, inextricable from Quran and, and from Islam. The translation is surely it is we who bring dead to life and what they send ahead and what they keep behind is being recorded by a manifest Imam. To go deeper into this, I will highly encourage you today or whenever you get a chance, these are, this is a holiday season, you, I'm sure you have more time, just go on YouTube and you'll find a speech from Ayatollah Akil Gharbi on exactly this point. Just Google Imam Mubeen and Akil Gharbi. Actually, wow. even you, if you just say Imam Mubeen, this speech comes up. This was um, his speech he, he made um, in the last, I think, two or three years in Bibi Bab Daman in Lahore. That's the basis of my this argument. I cannot go deeper into this. For many of us, this is an element of faith as well. But I am referring, I am encouraging you or inviting you 
that even if you want to look at it from a very logical point of view, faith is our faith. We often argue it's blind faith. Although there is no such thing when this conception of the idea of religion was given. It is nothing about blind faith. Yes, there is first this belief, but there is this constant understanding and phase of knowledge that is linked and associated with it. Correct. The argument here is very central, which is not about the Imams and the great personalities that have been in the past. Mm. This, according to many scholars, mostly related and associated with the institution of al they argue that Imam Mubin is about the 12th Imam, Imam al-Mahdi. Oh. Oh. Just two more points and I still have to uh, mention many more things. I'll just explain. There must be so many credible number of ahadis and narrations in support of the idea that there is an Imam Mehdi. The difference between various schools of thought only is that some argue, the school of Ayril Bayt argue that these are the 12 in succession and the 12th one is Imam Muhammad Mehdi in the Ahl Sunnat Pal Jamaat. The tradition they fully believe in every word that you associate with Imam Mehdi. It is only that they argue that no, he will be born. So there is no doubt about the presence or about the fact that he has to come. So at this time I am only going to focus on the commonality point. This whole argument of 12 succession Imams, there is no time here to make that argument. I am only saying there is a consensus even among all different sects of Islam that in the end there is going to be a 12th There is going to be an Imam who will come, who will be the representative of God. I am just using that as a part of my institutional arrangement that God has created. Because he will not come in the end, whether you are a Shia or Sunni or even a Wahhabi. I have seen this reference actually in the Wahhabi tradition as well. They also belong and they also await Mehdi. The Christians and the Jews of course also wait. The fact is that whenever he will come, at that moment, there will be certain responsibilities that he will have to perform. The most central being that this religion Islam was not a utopia. This was doable, this was practicable mm -hmm. and he will actually prove it and implement it. But I will move forward. I am only interested here in the point that this institutional arrangement is there. And this is the, the fact that Mehdi is going to come is a part of that institutional arrangement. This brings me to my fifth point. Thank you very much for your, for your patience and um, hearing this like attentively. Like the fifth point is linked to what we hear, which, what we heard from some scholars here about Fakir or Fakiri. In this context, as you have seen, I have mentioned Quran was the first source of inspiration. The Quran was the first part of the institutional arrangement. The second was the linkage between the Prophet of Islam and Hazrat Ali. The third was the modern institution of sciences which were established by Imam Bakir and Imam Jafar Sadiq. And by the way, in those institutions, what they taught was rational thinking. Mm. What they were, they were able to support the scientists because they said this is going to be an open and in, in independent inquiry. This is not going to be necessarily very religious based. That was the third principle. The fourth was the whole concept of Imam Mubin. The fifth one is for which I have to take, um, uh, I, I'll have to depend upon an uh, about, about the name, some names to explain that point which is this connection between saint and saint. A network which we know from even the world of religious scholarship about Saluk, that this exists. We perhaps don't know the very dynamics and the intricacies and the sensitivities. But we do know that Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi remained a great religious scholar throughout his life. And he had a great number of supporters as well in Konya. It was only once there was this chance meeting with Shamsi Tabrez who met him and Rumi had come to know that Shamsi Tabrez is some great scholar. So he met Shamsi Tabrez who said to him that I see this bag on your shoulder. What is this? 
and Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi, the greatest of the poet, actually is only one, um, I would argue, Islamic personality, which any bookstore, you go in any part of the world, especially in the United States, and I've tried that, you'll <coughs> find a book on Rumi. So the Rumi said to Shamsat Abrez, um, that I have an, uh, I know there are a couple of people who know this um, narration better than me here in the audience. Rumi argued that this is a bag in which I have all my notes, because he was a jurist. He was a religious scholar. You can call him um, a scholar in a madrasa. He said, these are all my notes about Islamic Sharia, about Makassad al-Sharia, and these are very close to me. This is what I teach. But Rumi had approached Shamsat Tabrez to seek knowledge. Shamsat Tabrez said, I have just one condition. Please throw this back. They were standing just across a river. He said, throw this back in the river. And Rumi said, what are you asking me for? This is the source of all my knowledge and my written notes from which I teach. Shamsat Tabrez said, well, then that was it. For me, if you want to gain something, the first requirement is you throw this back in the river. And then, actually because the tasking must have been there, Mr. Shamsat Tabrez took away the bag and threw it in the river. And Rumi was really perturbed and worried. And these, he started running after Shams Tabrez. And there are various versions of this narration. The point is that when Rumi was really um, in agony or in pain and frustration, he just realized that <coughs> all the pages, that all the books and his notes which were in the river started flowing and flying back towards him. The point I'm making here, this whole spiritual experience of some argue of 40 days between Shamsat Tabrez and Rumi transformed Rumi to the extent that Rumi became the greatest of the mystics. Oh, wow. And the message which had to be had to go through the hands of Rumi had its own significance. But it came through Shamsat Tabrez. And this is just one example. Look at the history of all the great Sufia, whether it is Data Ganj Baksh or Ali Hajveri or it is in, in Hyderabad or any of the big names of Nizamuddin Aliyah or Ajmer Sharif, the great saints, the responsibility and the networking that they have about transferring of this knowledge which is not dependent on the written word. There is this some other network that exists. Um, and to support my argument, I can actually only give you these big names. Um, Islam in South Asia actually was dependent on the grace, on the guidance of these Sufia. What fiqh they belong to, whether they were jurists or not, that's an entirely different debate, and which I'm not going to get into at this point. I'm only referring it also as a part of the institutional arrangement that was established from God, that this flowing of knowledge, at times spiritual knowledge, at times knowledge of sciences, that this continues a dynamic which exists and which prospers. Mm -hmm. So after these three ideas, of from one from Quran and one from Hadith, and then the, this institutional arrangement as well, I want to briefly talk about, again with the five ideas, on what were the biggest obstacles? And I am coming to the very close of my presentation. What were the five biggest challenges and obstacles? Because something must have stopped this also, or made an attempt also, to create hindrances. And those five challenges are also very critical in understanding. The very first is a theological challenge which was posed, which had argued after the Prophet that the book is enough for us. There were people who, in fact, were saying, you would argue that yes, someone who's saying yes, they believe in the book of Quran, it means that they really believe um, in the message of Quran. But those people had a very different idea about it. When they argued that book is enough for us, they were distancing themselves from the seven layers of the meaning that I had referred to initially. They were trying to cut themselves off from the other people, which I had mentioned, for instance, Hadrat Ali salam, and the Ahlul Bayt. They wanted to create a disconnect because they jumped into the field of power politics. That was the first major challenge to this whole tradition of learning and scholarship. It was politics, but it was produced and framed under the title, this book is enough for us. The second challenge that came 
was some, I would argue, later stage scholars who started saying that Islam and science are two different things and they pursue the path in different directions. And it was among the Ghazali as well, some, some very, very big names who partly made this argument because of their own ignorance and knowledge. Some others could see that their status as scholars was slipping out of their hands. They also made that argument. And this is also a continuing debate. All I will say in response to this is, the pick up Quran and you will find at least 15 to 20 percent of all the verses which make a reference either to the creation or to some element of physical science. Quran. Actually, Pervez Hudboy and others argue that this is 40 to 50 percent of the Quran. They argue that other 40 percent is about history and this 40 to 50 percent is about of some element of science. Those who lack that insight, which God is asking you in Surah Al Imran, that only those will understand who have the insight. So th the people who disconnected themselves from the Ahlul Bayt had very limited arena to operate. Wow. That's why what they couldn't understand, they said, well, science and Islam are two different things. We don't even want to go towards science. And that started creating a blockage wow. in the Islamic history. Hmm. The third obstacle came in the name of authoritarianism. Hmm. And here, the it was very appropriately mentioned uh, by, I think, Siddiqui Sahib, when he argued that Islam had come against this concept of Malukiyat. There was a reason behind it. And I highly encourage you just to pick, Najul Balava, pick, you pick and read that the ideal thing, just read the most famous letter to Malik ibn Ashtar. And I have done that um, in my humble way. Uh, this is what um, Ali was uh, making a reference to also, um, a short booklet, Ali ibn Abi Talib on leadership and good governance this is available on Kindle everywhere else. If you want it, uh, send an email to Ali and I'll send the, the PDF to you as well. <coughs> what, and I looked at 22 different um, books, actually the one book which I, um, two books that I bought from Saudi Arabia. There are two very major uh, theses which are written by modern Wahhabi scholars on Hazrat Ali alayhi salam, which uh, by and large, other than some major elements uh, which they differ with uh, other traditions, but they are great acknowledgement of Hazrat Ali's science and knowledge. The letter to Malik ibn Ashtar, which I am linking with the idea of authoritarianism, and as the Dalai Salam, he was always saying, whatever I am telling you, this is what I have learned from the Prophet. Mm. He was nowhere claiming some original or unique source. Yes. And his emphasis on the system of welfare, the establishment of a modern welfare state, I am now using the modern political science terminology, but you pick the letter to Malik ibn Ashtar and you will find in a step by step fashion the whole idea of accountability, the whole idea of the ruler, how he will be elected or selected. Even if that is controversial, I'll just explain when Hazrat Ali salam was talking about the responsibilities of ruler, he had said at that time that when the audience comes to the ruler, the ruler should ensure that none of the security forces are present there so that the people may not feel harassed and oppressed. Again, many of the ideas of transparency associated with the modern political institutions, the basis of that are so obviously reflected in the letter to Malik ibn Ashtar. The point I am making only here is that this concept of authoritarianism was the most serious dagger drawn into the heart of Islam and the Islamic tradition. And this was one of the biggest obstacles that was the case with the big tribes thousand years ago. That is still the case today. And that you should keep in mind as a major obstacle to, to this tradition of learning and scholarship. I come to my fourth point. My fourth point is, which again, um, I was alerted by what, what I saw the presentations and I briefly uh, had a brief conversation with Ali also previous to that. Historically, when all these the names of the scholars that you have seen, look at their bios and biographies and histories, you will not find that many of these scholars were killed. 
the dialogue and discourse whether you are from the school of Ahlul Bayt or Ahlul Sunnah or whether you are Al Farabi or Al Ghazali or others, they were in the in the habit of having this discussion in a very scholarly fashion. The modern obstacle that has come about is this modern idea of extremism which is explaining or emphasizing your point of view through use of force which we call extremism. Very nice point. This is the fourth major principle or the fourth major obstacle to learning and scholarship or the history and the tradition of learning and scholarship. And last but not the least I must add is sectarianism. Sectarianism also has been and whether it is from inside Islam or in any fashion or form supported from outside this is also an element which directly hits at the core of this idea of knowledge and scholarship within Islam because this is how you divide the whole religious tradition in different blocks and then it becomes very easy to discredit anything for such and such school, the knowledge and scholarship of such and such is false or useless. So these are the five obstacles. And I immediately jump and conclude by saying, so this whole, my argument built again on these five principles just so that, and I had mentioned the five I picked um, intentionally for continuous blessing of the five as well. But I'll conclude with the five things that you and we can do. If we understand this centrality, <laughs> of knowledge and scholarship embedded in the idea of Islam, then we need to do a few things. The five final things that you and I, we can do, first is to go to the very basics. Focus on education and knowledge, seeking knowledge as a basic fundamental principle because the Prophet of Islam was so clearly saying it is binding on you. So if you and we here have the access to go to schools and colleges, there are many people in the world and many of the countries that we come from who do not have this luxury if I may call that. Strengthening and supporting education in any shape or form. You cannot just jump to your own idea. That was never the central Islamic idea. It was always based on rationality and dialogue and, and discussion. Yeah. Had Prophet or any of the Imams ever stopped any from, from asking a question? Never. Yeah. So any support that you can give to the institutions of learning and scholarship anywhere is the first <coughs> thing in our humble ways that we can do. Sure. The second one, based on what I mentioned, that authoritarianism being the strongest challenge to learning and scholarship, defines to authoritarianism must be the second principle for us as human beings to opt for in what shape or the form whatever is doable or possible the third idea that I would link it with also is what I just said defeating sectarianism and in the presence of this very basic verse Anything which can be translated as a derivative of the word tafarraku. What is the derivative? Firka. Firka. You are directly being stopped from doing it. So yes, you would call your institution as a school of a certain jurisdiction. Fikha, these are all very very valid words. But the word firka has a very negative connotation. The fourth point what we derive from this, what you and we can do, is always to be global in our approach and focusing first on human beings and then on even religious identity. Well, I'll just explain this one small anecdote. About two weeks ago, I had the greatest of honor when to go and see um, Ayatollah Sistani. I was very lucky that he gave me audience. Although there were layers of interviews, you have to go through certain layers of interviews when you, if, and then you are given this audience. Um, and when I asked him, it was a short meeting, um, I wanted his, his guidance on, on actually a book project that I'm doing, which I'll also mention because that is very relevant to my last point. Um, and when I requested him that um, this is what I'm here for, um, and I said, can, um, can you guide me 
as a scholar, what is my role as a scholar? I want to know. What is in my tradition, what my tradition teaches me? And he said something which, which um, honestly is, is still ringing in my head. He said, I will go just to Imam Ali's shrine and his, his place of office is just right in front of the shrine of Imam Ali alayhi salam. He said, and I, I feel really honored, he said, I'll go there and I'll pray that God helps you to distinguish between your own views and opinions and the truth and reality. <laughs> By which he was, and then he explained, he said, that is the real test of scholarship. Don't add your personal opinions and views into what you find based on your objective research as to be the honest truth. The fifth point I want to refer you to is that this whole effort that we have talked about is also, it, it also owes to one person in a great way that for intentionally I kept the reference till the end. That this whole effort is not wavered. This whole effort is very goal oriented. And in this whole effort of orientation, the blood of Hussein is in the foundation of that building. Without the sacrifice, this whole tradition of scholarship and learning would not have been groomed. In the foundation of this edifice of Islam, lies the blood of Hussein and the other members of Karbala. And I am not, not making a reference to it because just um, by tradition and convention that I have to end it like that. I will just invite you to read one of the shortest khutbas of Imam Hussain on the day of Ashura. I had started off with the seven verses and I encourage you, so these are very easy to remember. The first eight verses of Surah Taha have a lot of spiritual significance. Remember me in your prayers as well when you recite. Imam Hussain on the day of Karbala said, his, and that is often mentioned in more beautiful fashion in Urdu than in English, and I'll come to um, my tribute later in Urdu as well. When he had said, O oh Allah, what did he find who lost you? And what did he lose? Who found you? Then he moved on to say, Oh Allah, it is you in whom I trust amid all grief. You are my hope amid all violence. You are my refuge and provision in everything that happens to me. The point I'm referring to that the greatest of the sacrifices was also built upon a certain level of knowledge and wisdom. It is a bit unfair to argue that the members of the Holy Family knew of all the details of Karbala. Why I'm saying this is, this at times takes away the credit some of the most monumental decisions on the battle of Karbala and in the days approaching Karbala were all taken by Imam Hussain salam in his great wisdom. Yes, they knew that something terrible is happening in a human worldly sense. But if we argue that this was all predestined, then this takes away the credit. The argument is that this foundation was nurtured through blood in a very choreographed but in a very thoughtful manner. And I will conclude with my humble tribute. This is how I will end. And I picked some verses from Iftahar Arif. Because thank you very much for your patience in helping me come to this point. And this is linked to my whole argument as well. This is a salam from Iftahar Arif. Karbala ki khaak par kya admi sajde mein hai? Karbala ki khaak par kya aadmi sajde mein hai maut rusfa ho chuki hai aur zindagi sajde mein hai wo jo ek sajda ali ka bach raha tha waqt e fajr wo jo ek sajda ali ka bach raha tha waqt e fajr fatima ka lal shayad ab isi sajde mein hai subhanallah fatima ka lal shayad ab isi sajde mein hai sunnat e paigambar e khatim hai sajde ka ye tool 
کل نبی سجدے میں تھے آج ایک ولی سجدے میں ہے وہ جو آشورہ کی شب گل ہو گیا تھا ایک چراغ توجہ وہ جو آشورہ کی شب گل ہو گیا تھا ایک چراغ اب قیامت تک اسی کی روشنی سجدے میں اب قیامت تک اسی کی روشنی سجدے میں ہے حشر تک جس کی قسم کھاتے رہیں گے اہل حق حشر تک جس کی قسم کھاتے رہیں گے اہل حق ایک نفس مطمئن اسی دائمی سجدے میں ہے نوک نیزہ پر بھی ہونی ہے تلاوت باد آسر those eight verses of سورہ تاہا نوک نیزہ پر بھی ہونی ہے تلاوت باد آسر مصحف ناتق تہ خنجر ابھی سجدے میں اس پہ حیرت کیا لرز اٹھی زمین کربلا اس پہ حیرت کیا کہ لرز اٹھی زمین کربلا راکب دوش پیمبر آخری سجدے میں